So hello and welcome everybody. Super excited to have Michael Marks with us. Known him for a long time. I don't think he knew I was around uh, because he facilitated the ethics discussions for ICF and he continues to host the water cooler on ethics. So really looking forward to what he's gonna share with us today. Such an important topic at any time, and it seems like it's really important right now. Uh, yes, we are recording this. Yes, we will send a link to you of the recording on YouTube so you can access it again. Please do continue to feed your questions. You can use the chat box. You can use the Q&A panel. We'll monitor that throughout. And if some of you want to be brave, Michael loves interaction. So you can raise your hand. We can set it up so that you can come on live and talk uh, and ask those questions. So Michael, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Hey, yeah, thank you, Kathy. Um, and, you know, uh, Kathy has been interacting with the ethics community. I don't know, Kathy, if you were back there in April 2017 when we did the first presentation on suicide awareness. And how that came about was uh, I was actually in my ICF chapter in Denver and someone was giving a presentation. And, uh, you know, I have to say she didn't really, you know, inspire me to do anything about my awareness with suicide, but I just got thinking about you know, we tell coaches all the time, if the client says suicide, you have to do something. Mm -hmm. But what do you do? You know, and so we set up this community of practice um, session in April 17. And it was just overwhelmingly, um, you know, received uh, by numbers as well as magnitude. And like, wow, we really need to get this out. Um, so since that time, it's kind of become a, this makes a sense, a passion for me here. I have never personally had any loved one or someone very close to me, you know, take their life. But it's just like, wow, we really need to get coaches informed on what to do when the client says suicide. And what I found is, as I've given presentations, you know, via Zoom all around the world in Iceland and the Philippines and the Ukraine and I don't know, all kinds of places, Germany, not to mention the North America, you know, most people say it's not my client that's bringing up suicide. It's the friends of my client. It's the relatives of my client. So part of where we're going with this is not only to inform you what to say in that situation, but also to be so mindful that when it comes to that kind of thing, you know how to help the people that want to help those that need the help. Uh, for example, I gave this presentation in in, um, in Ireland not too long ago, and the um, well, one of the participants requested my uh, presentation, you know, which we sent to him, and Kathy can send it to you, or I can send it to you, whatever works best. And um, about six months later, one of his clients in California called him and said, "My sister is suicidal, and I need to know what to do." And the only thing he could remember was my presentation. Now, there's a lot, you know, a lot of places you can go when you need help, and I'll be bringing a lot of those up here. But the only one that he could remember was my presentation. He called it up. He kind of walked through that presentation with his client in California. She was able to talk her sister off the ledge, so to speak. And um, to be trite with the cliche, everyone lived happily ever after, but seriously, you know, um, just knowing what to do. And there's some really, really basic things here. This is not hard, but it is serious. And it is so serious that we all get a little panicky at that moment. I've done several interventions. My most recent one was I was visiting my son in Florida and we were you know, eating lunch. And this guy in Cal Colorado calls me and says, Michael, um, there's this guy in my garage and he's, he's, he's got a gun and he's going to use it. Um, can you talk to him? It's like, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, and, you know, I talked to him and uh, within 30 minutes, he texted back and said, we're on our way to the emergency room. He's given me his and um, I'll let you know what happens. So, you know, it's just, it's, the intervention in and of itself is is really simple. I think you'll see that really soon here. But like I said here, it's scary and it's serious and everyone needs to know how to do this. Everyone, not just coaches. My heart 
is for coaches doing this because an interventionist is practically a coach. You know, a coach asks powerful questions, listens really well, and comes up with an action plan, right? And an interventionist asks powerful questions, listens really well, and comes up with a safety plan. So really the only difference between, you know, coaching in a, in a live environment and an intervention is the safety plan. So that's kind of where we're going to, to focus most of the time. Uh, so put your questions in the chat or the Q&A and Kathy will keep up with that and, and I'll try to keep up with that as we go along here. Um, I'll start my screen sharing. All right. How does that look, Kathy? Looks great. Okay. So, um, you know, in this first slide, uh, I'm showing you the differential between 1999 and 2000 uh, that has increased 30% in, in the United States. And, you know, when you think about statistics, it's increased because there's been more suicide and or the reporting is better. Um, so, you know, when we say there's 30% more in that time period, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's more people as much as more people are being reported. So we don't really know. You'd be surprised with as much research and as much reporting is done on suicide that it's actually not well reported. And there's some reasons for that. There's some stigmas. So you look at that and you say, way to go, Nevada. You've decreased 1%. Well, and again, there too, before 1999, they had one of the highest rates in the nation. And so, <laughs> you know, coming back down uh, to a decrease basically became because Nevada put themselves in action about how to increase awareness um, in general. So there's this give and take when we talk about really what's going on. And when we think about COVID, oh my goodness, what does that mean? You know, people are going to be super scared in a couple of weeks. You know, they're already scared. And then when, you know, they start trying to, uh, the, the, the new word this week is reopen, right? When we reopen, um, then, you know, their job opportunities, their revenue streams are, are not the same. Um, you know, of course, there are opportunities. Some people are actually increasing revenue streams, but for the most part, the vast majority is people are really, you know, in dire straits. And that could stay that while for a long time. And as longer that sustains, the darker the thoughts get. Okay, so let's go over a couple of scenarios. Um, someone your client knows is thinking about suicide. So all of these are are true and the names have been changed to protect the, the innocent. Um, client calls you on a Sunday. Her sister has just visited after a discussion centered around Valerie's sense of hopelessness. Sally does not believe that she's in any immediate danger, but she's concerned about what to do. Um, this is what we would call a low level risk. Um, you know, it's called ideation, not, um, you know, implementation or, you know, to use the expression execution, but um, just the ideation around that uh, possibility. She's thinking about it here. And definitely a place where a good coaching intervention, you know, a good helping people move forward. We'll camp out as long as you need to and want to about the, you know, saying we're not therapists and we're not supposed to do therapy. And they're like, yeah, that's right. So how do we keep the client alive? And how do we keep people alive long enough so that the right therapist can intervene and help the person get mentally um, fit? Um, so there's still that forward focused coaching emphasis here on um, moving the client forward. Ideation, Frank, mentions in his coaching session that his wife talks several times about taking his life and he's scared and he's angry. How could she think about hurting him and their children like this? So, you know, it's, it's a coaching topic here. Frank does not need a mental health intervention here. He needs to get around the fact that he's angry with his wife 
and he wants to help her, but yet he still wants the family to be able to move forward here. So there's this kind of survivor guilt compiled with, um, you know, uh, helplessness because he doesn't know what to say or how to say it. Your client has several staff members who have had to take a leave of absence due to mental duress. Um, and as the business leader, you're looking for a rationale um, for you know, giving them time off, but you still have that, that fear of suicide. What can you do to help your clients? So, you know, especially right now, we've got this such tension in our world where people are you know, really needing that time off, but then getting you know, the time off, but not the help, and there's not the access to the mental health community that there used to be. Um, so what can you do to help? So I'm going to let all those questions hang and start charging through that here. Um, let me just read this question from Ruth. I'm curious about how to both simultaneously be simultaneously creating an action plan and preparing for a safety plan. My niche includes many of those who both threatened and do die by suicide. Mm -hmm. Okay, We're, Ruth, let me know if we don't adequately address that question, because I think the next couple of slides are going to pretty much um, center in on that. So uh, what are the warning signs? Assist training calls these balloons. I like that. Uh, someone's setting up a, a balloon, basically an invitation to tell you um, something's shifted, something's different. Um, you know, ask me what's going on and you know a lot of people are doing this subconsciously they're not doing it very overtly but let's talk about some of the um, warning signs the red flags people are talking about wanting to die or kill themselves um, they're looking for a way to kill themselves it's what we call means uh, they're, they're searching online they're buying a gun um, you know they're collecting items here in the third world um, better said, you know, in developing countries, the um, major means method of suicide is um, um, pesticides and animal poisonings. Um, whereas in the United States, it's mostly guns with men and carbon monoxide poisoning with women. So, you know, you also have to be kind of a little bit aware of what is the environment of the person that you're working with here. Do they live in the city? Do they live in the country? You know, what's their, what's their potential for um, collecting a, um, a harmful means? Uh, talking about feeling trapped or an unbearable pain. You know, I'm just such a burden to everybody. Um, I'm just so, you know, um, useless and I, I feel like I can't go anywhere. All those type of things become, you know, signals. And, and, and when I hear them, my alarm, you know, and, and go off, my antenna go up and I start, you know, thinking, okay, let's listen for a second one that might confirm that the person's, you know, going into a dark place. Um, talking about the, you know, being a burden to others, um, especially young, you know, a, an older person being a burden to their adult children, uh, increased use of alcohol or drugs, uh, being anxious or agitated, um, behaving recklessly, basically, you know, a, a behavioral change, sleeping too much or, or too little. She used to wear a lot of makeup. Now she doesn't wear almost any, or she used to never wear makeup, and now she uses a lot. Um, you know, he cut his hair into a mohawk. Um, he cut all of his hair off. He, she had beautiful long hair and she cut it short. You know, those are just, you know, signals for attention seeking, none of which, of course, mean that the person is uh, entertaining thoughts of suicide, but that, that there's a shift going on in their lives. Um, withdrawing or isolating themselves, showing rage or, or, or talking about seeking revenge. Um, you know, extreme mood swings here. I, I was, I was talking to my son who was going through a divorce, and we were in a U-Haul going across country, and I said to him, you know, uh, son, a lot of people that are going through a divorce, um, go into a dark place and they start thinking suicidal thoughts. And he said, ah, that's ridiculous. 
like, okay, you know, you know, um, just saying that's, that's, that's often the case. And so if you need anyone you know, to talk to, you know, let me know. And the next morning at breakfast, he said, you know, I was thinking about what you said, and I, I don't think I'm in a dark place, and I don't think I'm going there, but I really appreciate that you brought up the subject here, and I know that I can talk to someone without judgment. Um, and I think that's kind of the key to the whole thing here. In a high-trust environment like coaching, it's all about working with the client in a, what I like to refer to as a no-judgment zone. Um, I learned that from one of my students years ago, and I put it on a sticky note for years on my um, monitor until it fell off. <laughs> Coaching is a no judgment zone, and a suicide intervention is a no judgment zone. What we're all trying to do is help people get forward. So there are three questions, and you're probably familiar with the first two. I'm always surprised at how unknown the third one is. So here they are. Um, the suicide atten attempt, you know, so there are thoughts. Are you thinking about taking your life? That first question, you know, have you thought about ending it all? Closed questions, you can say those are not good coaching questions. Well, we're actually being a little bit intentional here. Um, you know, if you want to open it up, you could say, to what extent have you thought about ending your life? Um, asking the, the, the client, you know, do, are you thinking of killing yourself? Isn't always the best question. Um, or are you thinking of hurting yourself? Um, they would say, oh, no, no, I, I would never, you know, hurt myself. I just, uh, you know, want to end it all. Um, so in the person's mind, there's a differentiation. And the second one, is there something lethal in your environment? You know, um, how has your life changed where you could go through with this? Um, you know, what have you acquired? What are you thinking about doing? And if the person responds positively with method, um, then, you know, we're, we're asking ourselves here, okay, is the person at a high risk or at a critical risk? And then, like I said, this third question, is there a history of you attempting in the last two years? Because very strong research shows that 83% of the people that um, do complete a suicide have attempted uh, a suicide within the last two years. So, um, you know, when all three answers are yes, then we automatically assume that the person's at um, critical risk or at high risk. And we'll talk about the differentiation between the different risk factors in, in a minute here. But when they are at critical risk, you move into the different intervention options. Persuade them to get additional support. Like I said, you're not a therapist, but you want to make sure that they stay taken care of. In other words, um, one of the principles, one of the ethical principles of coaching is never abandon a client. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to stay with them, um, but somebody does. So a trusted um, person needs to be in their lives that could be a mental health pro professional, that would be great. Um, it might be a very close friend, a relative, a pastor, you know, um, uh, someone that gets a lot of respect in, in their lives, but at the same point in time, you're really wanting just that the client feels taken care of. Um, of course, if you can refer to a good therapist, um, you, you want to be able to, you know, fellowship with them. And I use that word because it's not really give and take of confidential information just as much as, you know, we're just kind of touching base with each other and the client, in other words, the suicidal person is okay that we kind of touch base with each other and keep up with how things are going when the risk is not, you know, critical right now. Um, so, you know, one of my friends says, I only refer to therapists that I know. In other words, I've seen them in action, you know, in a webinar, in a seminar, or, um, 
you know, I've uh, participated in their work in myself. I think that's a good idea here, but what it comes down to is there's uh, the need for you to know who to refer to. And we'll talk about that when we start, you know, saying, well, I'm in New York and my client is in uh, Kentucky, so how do I do that? Um, so you have the 800 numbers and I have them on the screen. Um, there is a, um, in some states, it's not fully implemented yet, an 811 number, which has been, you know, implemented to kind of correlate with 911. You can remember 811, where the person on the other side of the phone is going to be um, mental health ready to, you know, move the client to a better place. <clears throat> so um, check with the person, the last one on that list. Uh, for you know, future suicidal thinking. The first 72 hours are critical. Um, and then it kind of moves in, in increments of seven days, you know, seven days, 14 days, 21 days. Each time, um, you know, another week goes by, the risk gets reduced by 10 to 20%, depending on their situation. So that, you know, you can do the math as to how long it almost takes before, you know, the the dust has settled, the storm has subsided, they're, they're ready to go on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking at this question from Amy. As I coach, I found you don't want to dismiss someone's thoughts or behaviors. I like the invitations or balloons. Um, I like to call them signposts. Yes, yes, signposts, um, you know, red flags. And like I said, most of the time, the person's not even aware of it. So let's look at some good questions that you ask when you see those signposts. Um, are you thinking about suicide? Tell me about it. Uh, what's your plan? You know, um, do you have a plan? Like I said, closed questions at this point in time aren't so bad here, but as good coaches, we really want to get them to speak more and to say more. You know, what's your plan? Well, I thought maybe I would, you know, buy a gun and um, you know, get them to talk about that. Um, have you ever made an attempt before? Like I said, that's that two-year uh, window type of thing here. Um, were you hospitalized? It seems to also be a telltale factor is if they were actually admitted uh, for suicidal tendencies, then some other professional, right or wrong, took it very seriously that they were suicidal. Um, and that last one, I think, is a wonderful question here. What is keeping you alive? What is stopping you? Um, and listen for attachments, responsibilities that is going to keep the person um, in an area of hope an area of care, like the garage incident I mentioned uh, where my friend called me. I, I was talking to him and I said, you know, Frank, if you go through with this, who's going to miss you? Oh, nobody's going to miss you. I said, do you have grandchildren, Frank? He said, yes, I do. How do you feel about your grandchildren? I love them very much. Are they going to miss you? Yeah, they probably would. What do you like doing with your grandchildren? Well, we like to go fishing. Mm -hmm. When is the next time you think you'd go fishing with them? Well, you know, we we're actually planning on doing that next weekend. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do you think the impact on those grandchildren would be if you couldn't go fishing with them because you had taken your life today? Oh, they would be devastated. And so that was pretty much the key for this particular I instance um, to talk him off the ledge, more or less. Um, there's two major areas that you go in your conversations, and that's care or hope. Um, the dominant one is hope, but that doesn't usually work in two classifications. Um, one of them is with people that are particularly young because they are so young, they just can't see beyond um, the barriers where hopelessness lies. In other words, they can't, if they're 15, they can't imagine 30. And if they're 20, 
they might not be able to imagine 40. Um, they're just not able to think that far. But if someone is usually older, 25, 30, whatever here, they can imagine 60 and they can imagine 80. And, and you can give them a, you can help them develop that sense of hope that life at 60 or life at 80 is going to be much um, more comfortable than it is right now. Um, but care almost always works. And so in the previous place that I lived, I was on call as a um, suicide interventionist in the, um, in the emergency room. And what we would do is, you know, if anything else, we would say, I care about you. You know, I drove here 45 minutes in a snowstorm to be with you because you are worth it. And everyone in this hospital cares that you you know, get through this and we all are here to help you. So that care element is very significant in getting people to understand that, you know, it's not just about themselves. People will miss them. People do love them. Um, and sometimes I don't use this one very often, uh, but um, you know, the reality is that if a person um, takes their lives, 18 people will be significantly mentally impacted, you know, negatively. 18 people for every one person that takes their life and for every person that attempts, it's double, it's actually 34, it, um, people have a, a significant impact by hearing this type of thing here. So, you know, Sometimes that helps people realize it's not about them. Like I said, I, I, I always approach using numbers during an intervention with, with care because I'm not trying to convince them. I'm trying to help them. So, you know, where we want to go next, what are the resources? QPR is the one that I recommend that everybody do. QPRinstitute.com. QPR stands for question, persuade, refer. And um, the gentleman that, you know, started this way of intervention said, we want to make it sound like CPR so people can remember it. Okay, it's like CPR, but it's with a Q. Good. So it's QPR. What does QPR mean? Question, persuade, refer. You ask them questions, you persuade them basically to stay alive, and you refer to them to a mental health professional. If you go to the QPR website, online course uh, that'll give you the very basics in an intervention for 29 new in live training and in um, you know online training, I would just encourage everyone, literally everyone, to take QPR training. Um, it's one of those type of things that once you've had it there, you can relax and say, "Okay, I have had QPR training." Um, when the situation arises, I'll know what to do. Um, there is the uh, Suicide Prevention Helpline, the national one, 1-800-273-TALK, um, or going on to theirs. So that's a national number. Uh, I would encourage you to find local numbers because for whatever reason, people that are in such distress would much prefer to talk to someone locally over the phone, which and my, you know, really doesn't matter if they're over the phone, they could be a thousand miles away, but no, I like to talk to someone locally. So find out what your local resources are. Um, and you can find out some of those things from, in the United States, the uh, Suicide Prevention Services, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, great says, studies on suicidology, suicide.org, or the International Association for um, Suicide Prevention. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop the share right there. Um, you know, I have some more statistics that we could go into uh, as to how, you know, suicide is um, developing um, in the way in which we're, you know, preventing it in the way in which we're, you know, using information here. But um, for coaches specifically, there's not a single source. So I mentioned earlier that I have a team of people that are, you know, getting together on a monthly basis and we're all trying to figure out ways to get coaches well-informed about 
um, suicide intervention. We started a nonprofit in January called um, Coaching Suicide Awareness, and hopefully this summer we'll launch our website where we can have a go-to place specifically for, for coaches, non-sport coaches, to go um, to get training in and help in, in suicide. Mm -hmm. So um, that's basically it, Kathy. I think I want to go more towards questions and scenarios and, and, and hear your stories. You know, um, it's interesting that when I talk about suicide, there's a lot of us that have had, you know, an intimate contact with these type of interventions. And I'd love to hear those right now um, because when I collect these stories and I use those as an examples as I help train other people here, but I think it's also really good for those of us in the room because you guys know each other probably um, to say that, you know, just this, just, you know, this, this school, this group of people, there's 20 of us on this call and these are the types of things that are coming out. So, you know, I'll just open up the microphone. What is your experience, questions, or concerns about suicide? And um, I'm kind of expecting you to ask some of the typical questions that I didn't put into my slide. So if you don't ask those questions, then I might have to come back to my slide deck and, and fill in a couple of missing pieces. But I highly suspect that they're going to come out in your questions right now. Mm -hmm. so Ruth raised her hand. Ruth, I've unmuted you on this end, so you can click your microphone to unmute and come on live and ask it. Um, I'm Ruth, and the people I work with tend to have chronic illnesses. Um, <clears throat> this actually occurred before I had master coach training, so I didn't really know what I was doing. I was kind of shooting from the hip, no pun intended. Um, mm -hmm. I was in a small group of women, all of whom share the same chronic illness, recognized that one was fading fast, and did um, other people recognized it, came to me, they were like, what are you going to do? Um, I was in contact with the woman who was in distress. I was in contact with her daily. Um, she had made attempts within the past two years. She had been hospitalized because of those attempts, and she did choose death by hanging. Um, the fallout from that um, was, of course, horrific. And the people who are alive who still share that chronic condition are still hysterical about it. I don't know. I think she's been dead for five years now. And now as a master coach, when those same group of people, because there are 12 of us in this little group, these same 12 group of people keep coming back to me saying, how could we have prevented that? And as a coach, I have said coachy things like, um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, how are you feeling about that? Uh, yet I feel like I, that they're looking to me, particularly because they do know I'm a coach now, um, but they're looking to me to say some kind of like miracle panacea and I don't have one um, other than to say it's terribly, terribly sad and we all miss her very much. Um, what can we do for ourselves and each other to keep people from entering that zone? And I, I'm my, so I guess my question is, what does one say to those who remain because they're in crazy pain? Um, a lot of, and I'm, I'm beyond my, my realm here when I say this, because so, I can't qualify it, but the way I understand PTSD mm -hmm. is there's a lot of survivor's guilt. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't die in the bombing. Um, what could I have done? And you survived. Um, and people feel guilty about that often. And without going further into what that means in terms of, uh, you know, what that individual means, but what could...
with the internet for this might sound oversimple here but i personally believe that talking about it is things and it's talking about those who Um, you know, that scenario that I gave here, his wife is thinking about taking his life about it at the dinner table. Are you, I mean, talk this. Yep. Michael, we're, um, when someone down the street or someone across town or someone, yeah. I, we lost a lot of that because of the internet connection. I'm going to turn my webcam off and maybe invite you to turn yours off to see if we can increase the bandwidth so that we can hear what you said there. Um, I think what we picked up is it helps to talk about it. And it sounded like you were giving a few examples. We didn't catch them. Okay. Um, so hopefully that is making it a little better does that sound it definitely more sounds complete better sentences, Kathy? Yeah. <laughs> yes now we're hearing it so i i apologize if you can repeat your answer i believe it will be very helpful okay i'm not sure where i you know was last you know cut off but where i was going was um talk about it you know, talk about it among the people that survive and talk about it among the people that need to survive. Um, and I mentioned, you know, this example that I gave earlier with the husband that's just kind of upset with his wife that she's suicidal here. They need to talk about it. Maybe they need to talk about it with a counselor, um, with a marriage therapist. I don't know. They just need to talk about it with each other here. But also, you know, in... Um, most situations, it's a forbidden topic. We just don't talk about suicide here. Well, I think the opposite is what needs to happen. When someone takes their life across town or down the street or wherever here, just say, oh, did you hear about, you know, Sally? She, um, she, she took her life. And you mentioned this during a dinner conversation or wherever, and, you know, let it be known that it's okay to talk about it because what normally happens is the survivor as well as the, um, the, the person who took their lives, they don't feel that there's anyone that they can go to. They just simply um, don't know where to turn and, and actually taking their life becomes the biggest option. And if they just had someone to talk to, there is research that shows that the 19 people that survived from jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, um, 19 of those who survived all say, if someone had just talked to me, I wouldn't have jumped. And all 19 said, as soon as my feet left the rails, I regretted it. And of course, hundreds of people have, you know, died jumping off that bridge. Um, but the point here is that they didn't want to. They just didn't see at the moment an alternative. Ruth, how does that help? Or yeah, Amy, it, I don't know who has. No, it was me, Ruth. Um, am I still unmuted? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, oh, of course, having lost a friend, it makes me sad to think that um, she, you know, actually she didn't realize that she could tell her parents that she was being domestically abused and they would have rescued her when they had said before, kind of, you know, paraphrase, you made your bed, now lie in it kind of thing. Um, they didn't really mean that. They would have really come and gotten her and taken her home. And so um, as a coach, you know, I'm not going to woulda, shoulda, coulda, because that's not helpful to me. Um, but looking at it now from a different perspective, I realized that I could have asked her, who might you be able to call? What would they say? What would those options look like? How would that feel without yes, knowing her? 
or just telling her, please don't, please don't, please don't. I love you. Um, so it's helpful and it, it's very helpful to me in terms of her family who continues to reach out because I was the last person to talk to her. Um, her family who continues to reach out and woulda, shoulda, coulda. Um, it's very helpful. So thank you so much. This is an amazing seminar for me personally because of the group I work with. So I'm Michael, very appreciative. Michael, if I may, um, a question I've used for some of the survivors when I've spoken with them is if you had the opportunity to ask that person now what they want you to do moving forward, what advice will they have for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful question. Um, great coaching question. Uh, it's sometimes referred to in coaching literature as the empty chair. Mm -hmm. And maybe that helps to expand on that thought is imagine that person's in this chair right now, yeah. you know, that empty chair that's in the room or, you know, virtually whatever, what would they say? Mm -hmm. you, you know, it might even be more simple. Um, what would they say? And you'd be I just amazed at what comes out with the, with that simple thing. Um, and then sometimes you, you, let, you go deeper with you. What advice would they give you? Cause you want it to be able to be specific. So, um, you know, just, uh, imagine, um, you know, that person were still alive. How would you be interacting with them right now with what you know versus what you didn't know then? So it's still kind of that empty chair, uh, tool if you will, at, in motion. Great, great. These are great points here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Amy has come on live as well. Yes, hi, Michael. Um, I lost a partner 17 years ago through suicide, and uh, this was before I became a coach, and I was directly, obviously, affected by it. Um, so peeing, backing off what your conversation was just now and Kathy's great question uh, in terms of survivor's guilt and um, just feeling what could you have done differently and as a coach now and working with people that um, I work with um, people who alcohol recovery field that are struggling sometimes with suicide and I have to separate myself because I feel connected. I feel this emotional connection and pull. And, you know, as a coach, ethically, uh, I have to separate myself from that. And I wonder if you have any tips for coaches out there who have been directly impacted and you're coaching people who are um, maybe suicidal. How do you um, separate that? Or do you just say, you know, I, I can't be effective for you. I want to recommend other coaches who may be effective. Well, there's, that's just a, such a quintessential uh, important question because, you know, it just touches on so many different, you know, levels. Um, first of all, you, the person who's also a coach, um, you're being affected by this here. So is, um, you know, in our coaching school, we say don't get hooked into the client's problem. Well, my goodness, if they're taking their lives, how callous would it be to be, you know, unhooked? Um, it would be very normal for that to happen. But at the same point in time, you know, if you are the conduit towards rescue for that moment, um, you need to be thinking about that rescue plan. And, and, you know, being able to move that here. So, you know, it's question, persuade, refer using the QPR model and referring them to that other person. So again, here, Amy, we get to that uh, line. Is it, is it low risk, medium risk, or yes to the three questions where it could be high risk or critical risk? Um, and, you know, if they're answering those three questions affirmatively 
distance or closeness doesn't really matter at that point in time. We need to save the person's life. Um, and if all else fails, I, I don't even mean that. Um, not, not the last resort here, but what you might just need to do is call 911. And where I live, there are instances where the sheriff comes and tackles the suicidal person and puts them in handcuffs um, because that's the best the sheriff knows how to do. So that person is under watch for 72 hours and they survive that time. And then we hope that they get the correct mental health. Is, is that the best intervention to be tackled by a sheriff and put into handcuffs? I don't know. It's not what I would want to happen if I were in that dark place, but um, it's better than the alternative, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not really sure how well I'm doing answering your question. Yeah, I, think, um, uh, I think the question also that Kathy asked is um, what would, you know, people that, uh, that you have a direct impact that you know who have um, committed suicide, what would they tell you right now? And, you know, when she asked that question immediately, I thought uh, my partner would say, forgive yourself. It wasn't your fault. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that for me uh, would help separate some of the guilt and shame that I feel, you know, as a coach, you know, when I'm working through these scenarios and being, you know, because I, I almost go into an anxiety um, a panic attack when they're talking about these things because of the guilt and shame that I personally feel. So separating myself as a person being directly impacted and as a coach working with this person. Um, so I think um, for me, what I'm getting out of it is doing some work on my thoughts, behaviors, beliefs, and working through that so that I'm able to effectively um, uh, work with other people who are dealing with this. Yeah, that is so powerful. Um, and, you know, continually to, to work through that for yourself with a deep grained respect for the lost person. Um, and that, that might involve some anger and it might involve uh, many, you know, different emotions, but deep down there's that respect for them and respect for yourself. And, you know, I'm not a psychologist. Um, my daughter is, and we talk about this at length. Um, so <laughs> I know enough to not venture into the topic because I don't understand all of the mental ramifications here, but at the core, it's, um, knowing that there is still love for the person and that is to be honored. Um, and, you know, if you do get training, especially like assist training, um, those that are you know, longer than just a couple hours, but a couple of, you know, days, the assist training takes 15 hours that I took, um, very worth every minute of it. But they also try to sometimes you're, you're, you're not going to be successful. In other words, um, you know, the person's going to go ahead and take their lives. And you have to realize um, you tried. Um, whether you actually said the perfect thing or not doesn't really matter. Um, but you did try. And if you didn't try, now you know what to do the next time so you can try thank you michael mm -hmm. no that was awesome that was awesome i'm uh, we still have quite a few people here so i'm curious for all of you whether you want to come in live or type into the chat box what's something you're taking away from this conversation uh, and while you're all thinking, hopefully typing, uh, Ruth's hand is back up. Ruth, were you wanting to come in again? Well, actually, I, I had forgotten to lower it, but I will say I uh, took 
took little snapshots of their of your reference list, particularly that training on suicide, because um, I'll definitely be doing that and wanted to share that with some others who deal with high risk populations as well. So um, that's all I have to say other than thank you so much for this. This is not only timely in terms of what we're going through as a world right now, but really helpful for me in terms of my own coaching group. So thank you. And I'll put my hand down. All right. Thank you, Ruth. Uh -huh. And if there are others who have questions, feel free to type them in or raise your hand and we'll invite you in. Um, Michael, I will share a couple people submitted things ahead of time. And uh, so one of them, um, well, actually, I think a couple of these you pretty much answered uh, really well. Uh, one question was, how do you know when and how to have a conversation about this topic? Mm. I don't think there's a good answer for that. Um, you know, uh, there's definitely some times not to have the conversation. Um, you know, the stress level's too high, the, um, uh, the fear factor is too high, um, And too high means to the point of dysfunctional. You know, I just don't think that happens very often. Like I said, this guy called me. There's this guy in this, my garage. He's got, you know, a pistol and he plans to use it. Can you talk to him? Well, the guy that called me was perfectly capable of uh, being an interventionist himself. He was just too stressed right at that point in time. So he reached out to what he thought was the next best alternative. Um, other than that, it's, um, my answer would be how, my answer would be often and when, um, as soon as possible. Um, but keep it short, you know, don't make it necessarily a two hour philosophical discussion. And, you know, we could go into the existing philosophies uh, around the world that say it's immoral, it's illegal, it's um, not right for someone to take their lives. Um, you know, I, I just don't go there. I, <laughs> I just I just don't go there ever because that's not what I feel passionate about. What I feel passionate about is keeping people alive. So I don't know how well that answers the question, but you know, um, how and when often and short. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, that's good. The a couple other things have come in. So one takeaway is that the role of the coach is to recognize the signs, keep the person engaged, so as to make the appropriate referral. Um, somebody else shared my goal was to learn more about this subject. My daughter is in therapy because she was having negative thoughts last fall. This is very helpful content. If I run into a client, family member, or friend who gets negative to this level, especially now with so many unemployed or lonely due to the COVID quarantine, another one shared for myself, this has been filled with invaluable information. I'm looking forward to taking the QPR course. And after looking into their website quickly, they also offer a course with individuals dealing with addiction, which is their niche in coaching. So another one like Amy, um, they just recently lost their best friend from suicide and all they, though they couldn't save them, now they'll be better equipped to help someone else. And a question did come in, um, how do you help parents whose children are suicidal when you suspect that the parent-child relationship is part of what is bringing the child to the point of hopelessness? I had that live in an emergency room. It was called in the emergency room at two o'clock in the morning, a 14 year old and her family was there. And I said, I'm a little confused why I was 
called in to monitor this young lady when her whole family is is there, um, her mother and her father and her two sisters. And the head nurse looked at me and she said, um, we suspect that it's because of the people in that room with her that she attempted suicide. Got it. <laughs> okay. So it was an interesting night, you know, that I was watching her and listening to her and talking to her, but I was also watching them that they were not attacking her verbally. Um, and what I learned from that experience was, um, you know, this was actually a Hispanic family. So there was a very high loyalty factor going on there. Um, and, you know, and we don't embarrass each other. We don't disgrace each other, especially to strangers. And, you know, I could really feel that in the room, but I could really also feel that the, um, the young girl, the 14 year old was, was grateful that she, um, was in an environment that was not her home. So what has to happen sometimes is, um, you know, a little bit stronger intervention where you say, you know, I really, really feel we need um, some third party intervention here. Um, and that of course should be a mental health professional. I'm not qualified to do it. I would never attempt it, but I know who, I know who to call. Mm -hmm. How yeah. does that do for an answer? Let's uh, give that person a minute to respond um, in the chat box. Um, Let's see, somebody else asked the question, I currently work with high school students. I know I would need to refer them to an administrator, but how do I handle a relationship with the student going forward when the student would much rather deal with me? Okay, there's a couple issues here on the table. One is mandatory reporting. Um, what are your obligations in the venue in which you work, in this case, the high school and the laws of the state of that high school, um, as far as mandatory reporting, you know, whether or not, regardless of the student's relationship to you, do you have to report that? And in 38 of the 50 states, there is mandatory reporting for abuse of uh, minors. Um, mandatory reporting on suicide is um, sketchy. You know, my team is actively out there looking for it. We're just appalled at how um, not addressed. I mean, just no evidence to point out what are the laws in your state. So it's actually kind of nebulous. So besides mandatory reporting, um, you know, you don't have to be a therapist to be there for somebody. You know, most of your closest people that are there for you are not there for you professionally. They're there for you because of love and care and concern. And we can all think back to our childhood where other adults uh, were there for us that might have been a youth pastor or might have been a high school teacher or might have been whatever, a Girl Scout troop leader, but we knew that they cared for us and believed in us. Um, and that's often enough. So it's really not so much of a question of um, being able to be the right therapist for them, but being the right ear, in other words, listener for them. Because most people, especially in distress, do not have someone they trust that they feel they can talk to. Yeah. If I, um, if I go back to the earlier question, Michael, with the parents, um, the response in the chat was a third party is useful, but they're not sure the parents that they're coaching will buy into that. Um, so they're talking to the parents whose child is suicidal. And so, and they believe the parents may be part of the reason the child is suicidal. Um, 
what comes up for me is back to the coaching questions uh, of, okay, so what are the reasons uh, for that child and what's a different possibility? And if you ask them, what might they say? And how important is it for you to take action? What's, what impact uh, do you want to have? Uh, and really, really digging into that with them is, is what occurs to me. What are your thoughts? Well, many here. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, we need to know what the risk factor is. Like I said, if it's critical or high, maybe your gut is just telling you this person's at high risk. Um, and so you need to get help to that person, whether it's you or someone else. If the parents are adversarial to that, um, then, you know, as I understand the laws in most states, there's not much you can do if they don't give consent to third party intervention. In other words, a therapist or even a coach um, being there, if a, most places, if the parent forbids a, a conversation between a third party adult and their child, then that's binding. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, it's not a good answer, but it becomes the responsibility of the parent to have denied that help to the child. That, that is a tough one. That's, um, no, that's, uh, <laughs> it's been an incredible conversation. Um, I, I realize we've gone over on time. Um, and I, I do have another group waiting on me, Michael, thank you so very, very much. We will of course share this, uh, with, with everybody. Um, so we'll send a link out, uh, and, and give it to all of you so you can come back and listen to this again. You can pass it on. Um, Michael, are you okay with me sending the PowerPoint with that email? Absolutely, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And use it as much as you need to change it in any way you feel set, fit. Awesome. Mm -hmm. We will do that. So thank you, everybody, for your time here, for your participation. And let's keep this conversation going. Absolutely. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm.